Uh, and uh, yes, and thank you very much for the introduction and uh, uh, yeah, to the BBKA team to invite me to talk to you today. Uh, so this is a another talk under the banner of the Atlantic Positive Project. Um, and uh, I um, am involved with this project, uh, especially um, to work on uh, searching for Asian hornet nests, um, which unlike some of the uh, methods you've heard about, which are about mitigating the effects in the apiary, this is more about uh, trying to control the population um, by finding and eliminating the nest. Um, so I'm going to give a, um, a an overview uh, of uh, the sort of searching for nests, but specifically under the Atlantic Positive Project, uh, I was um, working on the radio telemetry technique, uh, sort of refining this this further and developing the technique for others to use. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions on other methods used for searching for Asian hornet nests that does not uh, involve uh, telemetry. So I'm hoping now we can move on. No. <laughs> I'm having all the technical glitches. That's uh, not moving on. Moving on. Thanks. <laughs> Last. Okay. So um, uh, as we, this is this is a statement we've come across loads of times before. So the Asian Hornet arriving in France in or before 2004, and that actually reflects the fact that there's a little bit of speculation, um, sort of around this. Uh, this is because uh, the first specimen was actually identified by an amateur entomologist in November 2005. Uh, and that was uh, feeding on uh, ripe fruit in his garden. Uh, he was aware enough as an amateur entomologist that this was a very unusual hornet and therefore uh, caught and explored what species this might be. So this was the first uh, realization that an Asian hornet had arrived in Europe. Uh, those um, uh, experts were consulted and based on what was sort of uh, known at the time, uh, it was sort of assumed that the uh, hornet would, the hornets would not survive the French winter. This was um, then unfortunately shown uh, or rather uh, was then disproved in the following spring when another amateur entomologist found uh, three specimens, probably queens, uh, about 30 kilometers away from that first site. This then uh, triggered, in essence, an alert in France uh, where sort of all relevant authorities were made aware of this. Uh, a survey was started to explore sort of to what extent the Asian hornet might have spread. And much to the surprise of the people involved, uh, the hornets uh, were already covering uh, five departments in the southwest of France. Uh, not in high numbers at this point, but nevertheless, they were clearly uh, sort of uh, spread already. Um, and this graph is a classic graph for invasive alien species. Uh, so we see uh, this sort of species introductions and how numbers can potentially escalate. Uh, there is a, a narrow window where eradication in the early stages of an invasive species arriving is possible. Um, but through time, as the numbers of these hornets and the area that they cover increases, it becomes more, uh, sorry, it becomes less and less feasible uh, to actually eradicate. And you're then going to change your strategy towards containment so that you, you basically try and keep them out of other uh, regions uh, in in that particular country, um, then uh, if if still control is not a um, possible to implement, then you move into a, a situation where really you are focusing more and mitigating the situation as population control is very unlikely. And that also um, reflects the, the sort of increasing costs that are then associated with these different phases. So in the UK, because of the situation in France and how this was developing, we were um, obviously uh, pre-warned. And uh, that led DEFRA uh, to ask the non-native species secretariat to conduct a risk assessment. Uh, and um, that was then published in 2011. 
And the UK was actually unique in Europe in that we also developed an Asian Hornet response plan uh, even before the Asian Hornet had actually arrived in the UK. Uh, so the emphasis of the rapid response is uh, very much on locating and the eliminating nests as soon as possible. Um, this is obviously then was put into practice when we had our first incursion in September 2016 with the Tetbury Nest, uh, where that was an opportunity to actually learn an awful lot and the uh, response plan was adjusted accordingly. And obviously with the subsequent uh, incursions we've, we've had then, every time there's new things learned and uh, there's also shared knowledge that comes in from overseas, such that uh, methods are sort of adapted accordingly. So in 2017, uh, DEFRA actually asked us at the University of Exeter uh, to explore to what extent off-the-shelf technology. So we didn't want to go down sort of years of developing something uh, bespoke, but actually what, to what extent could we take something that is already available and adapt this for finding Asian hornet nests more effectively. This resulted in our publication in July 2018. Um, and this is then uh, where the Atlantic Positive uh, project kicks in afterwards, where we are then sort of refining this technique and also uh, focusing very much on enabling others to utilize this technique. So the idea was uh, very much uh, that uh, we would conduct various workshops within the Atlantic Positive project, but unfortunately that's where COVID hit and we had to uh, rethink and therefore a lot of the training materials uh, we have either provided or are in the process of uh, releasing uh, have been done online or we've also generated sort of manuals that incorporate videos that show sort of how the work is done. Uh, and this basically just because obviously during most of the Atlantic Positive uh, project uh, sort of face to face things weren't uh, that easy. So this, uh, the next few slides are, are from the guide that we have developed, and I'm going to whiz through this quickly because of time, uh, and, uh, but hopefully you will get a flavor of what's involved. So uh, first off, um, we probably need to touch on legislation. So uh, as far as invasive non-native species are concerned, uh, there is legislation around these, and they stipulate that one must not intentionally introduce, keep, breed, transport, sell, use, exchange, permit to reproduce, or release into the environment, which all makes perfect sense. Um, although it does cause um, a little bit of a problem when you are uh, fitting a radio transmitter to a Hornet and then releasing it. Um, and whether this uh, sort of contravenes the legislation or not, or whether a permit requires, does differ from region to region. So in some areas, uh, it's uh, seen as not being a problem because the intent is on eliminating the nest. Um, it's also you don't, uh, you're not putting a transmitter on a reproductive um, uh, cast, it's going on to a worker. Uh, but a number of countries do require uh, this to be done only under permit. And in the UK, uh, it's currently not permitted for people to do who are uh, either not an authorized agency uh, or otherwise someone working in uh, directly with uh, the authorized authority or agency. So the message basically is check in your region uh, sort of what the situation is. Uh, so this is obviously for other people outside of the UK. So radio tracking is a well-proven technique. It's, we, we're very familiar with it. We've seen wildlife programs. It's been around for over 50 years and it's used uh, sort of conventionally sort of to track the movements of wildlife, especially sort of larger mammals, birds, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's actually something that has only relatively recently sort of uh, been used with insects. And that's due to um, the size of the transmitters or radio tags that are, are required, uh, that obviously insects wouldn't be able to uh, carry many of, uh, carry these um, until relatively recently as technology has developed and we're now moving into to weights where that the insects can carry. Uh, the technique is also sometimes used to track individuals that belong to a social group uh, with the intention of finding that group, whether that's a pack of wild dogs uh, or, or, or um, 
another grouping that uh, aggregates every now and then, and it especially applies to social insects. Um, so this is sometimes referred to the Judas method in terms of finding uh, a grouping or a nest. So the transmitters, as I mentioned, we have uh, some very small ones that are now be being developed. They usually are used for very small birds and bats, but these are now in a size range where it is possible for larger insects uh, to carry these. Uh, and obviously, they, uh, as technology has moved on, they're even getting smaller. Uh, but there's uh, obviously sometimes the range is more limited with the smaller ones. Uh, and also there are obviously price differences uh, with the latest technology. The receivers, uh, you would need a receiver to pick up the signal that's transmitted by the uh, radio tag or the radio transmitter. And there are various commercial companies around, uh, sort of around the world who provide these. They range in um, price from 500 pounds to 1800 pounds. Uh, and to some extent, you sort of get what you pay for. Um, but you know, if, you're, uh, if you're a radio hack uh, and you've got the, the skills to do so, you can actually um, sort of adjust a, a VHF radio receiver for tracking purposes, although the functionality might be a little bit more limited then. But it obviously brings the cost down even further. Uh, the, you'll need an antenna. Um, and typically this is, would be a sort of a multi or three to five element Yagi antenna that's then uh, connected to your receiver via a coaxial cable. And typically they're around about 150 pounds. But again, there are online guides. If you are uh, sort of, um, if you've got an engineering background, um, I know people um, who make these themselves uh, for a fraction of the costs. Um, they do need to be made specific for the frequency band uh, that you're going to be using. And so uh, they are prescribed bands for wildlife telemetry. In the UK, that would be 173 megahertz. And on the continent, that would be 150 megahertz. Um, and uh, well, obviously, the first part uh, when tracking a hornet is you need to catch your hornet. Um, you want a hornet that is in prime condition. Uh, and therefore, it's probably best to avoid ones which have been caught in a trap and might have been sitting there for some time, as these are not likely to be in a very good condition at that point. Um, so in terms of catching a hornet, you can do this at various locations. A hornet's coming, hawking at your hives, can be caught with, uh, with a net. Uh, you, you then contain them in a plastic tube. Uh, you can put baits out, uh, like protein baits, um, so uh, here we've got uh, an example from Galithia. Uh, I think I might just speed up the video just to make sure I get through everything. So you can see the hornets coming to a piece of chicken uh, that's been hung out. Uh, so you get plenty of hornets coming in. And then uh, if uh, Sandra will in a moment select a particular individual she's after uh, and uh, um, uh, will try and net that. And I'll just let this video run to show you how relatively easy it is. Uh, once you've got your hornet in the net, you close off the net by just uh, um, sort of spinning it. Um, so it's a bit of a twist in it. Uh, and then with a sample tube, uh, you just basically collect that uh, the hornet in your tube. So it's straightforward. Um, so uh, you can also use uh, obviously other baits. So these are more uh, sort of sugar related baits. So either wick pots has uh, been developed in Jersey or even open sources. Um, and again, you can use uh, um, sort of just a simple uh, sort of queen catcher. Um, so hopefully you, oops, I need to stay here for it to run. So very relatively straightforward to catch them once they are intent on feeding. Uh, before that, they're a little bit more wary. Uh, once you've got your hornet, you want to make sure that you've got uh, a good specimen. So any damage to the wings would probably make it less able to carry the tags and therefore may not be the best option. So ideally, you want to catch a number of hornets uh, and then choose the, the best one that's available to you. Um, and uh, because of the the, uh, the size of the tags, we do tend to need to use the largest available hornets. 
um, but I'll get on to the options uh, in that area a little bit later. To, uh, to judge the size of a hornet, we found that fresh weight is relatively easy, and you can get these small uh, jewellery scales off uh, the internet for as little as 20 pounds, and they weigh down to a milligram, which is uh, more than adequate. Um, we found, we published in our paper in 2018, uh, that um, the hornets can carry up to 80% of their uh, body weight. Uh, so that gives you a guide uh, once you've caught a hornet, what sort of transmitter you'd be able to use with it. Um, fresh weight does vary a little bit. It's the most practical thing for us to use. You could maybe want to do all sorts of measurements, wing measurements, etc. But ultimately, that is extremely difficult on a live specimen. And you obviously want to keep your specimen live to be able to track it. Um, so we make some allowances. Uh, so I, although hornets can carry up to 80% of their body weight, we tend to choose uh, uh, choose larger hornets where the horn, uh, where the transmitter then makes up more like 65 to 70 percent of the body weight. Um, and uh, here that is sort of represented. So we've got a range of tags uh, with different weights. And you can see in this far column, basically this is uh, at what 80 percent basically means. So I, uh, with one of the larger tags, you would be only able to uh, track or horn it uh, that is 350 milligrams or over that. Um, actually, that is real right on the borderline there. So ideally, you're going to be looking for a hornet, which is sort of over 400 milligrams or 430 milligrams for this particular tag, uh, which is a quite powerful tag for a small, uh, for a small tag, um, but it does weigh 280 milligrams. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you can actually see that with one of the newer tags, which are about half the weight of the uh, the other tag I just mentioned, uh, you are now talking about uh, tracking tags around uh, 200 milligrams, uh, which gives you a lot more options. Um, and uh, it does depend a little bit in where you are. So if we're in the UK, uh, we're obviously not inundated with hornets, thankfully, uh, but that does mean that you may not have the same uh, number of hornets to select from. Uh, sometimes I, from colleagues in Germany, I've heard they've been in locations where there's only been a single hornet around. So in those circumstances, you, you're better off having a range of transmitters or radio tags available to you so that you can choose the most appropriate one for the size of the hornet that you have. In areas uh, where you have plentiful hornets around, obviously it's a lot simpler. You need to maybe less wor worry less about the transmitters you have, but uh, just basically make sure you choose the, the best hornets from those that are available. Um, you do also need to take into account where you are. So in a very flat open terrain, it makes it a lot easier in terms of tracking. So even the smaller tags, which are slightly less powerful, are easier to, to sort of follow. Once the terrain gets more complex, if you're in the mountains, signal can be partially blocked. So you want a more powerful tag if you possibly can. Or otherwise, you need to use other little tricks that give you an idea of what direction to go in to reacquire the signal if it is lost. Um, so now into how we attach the, uh, the transmitter uh, to the Hornet. So because uh, handling live stinging insects is quite daunting, uh, we've actually um, used anesthesia. We prefer to use anesthesia. Uh, and uh, it also uh, is better in terms of there's less likelihood of damaging the Hornet in the process. Uh, we use um, crushed ice. Uh, it's, it can take sort of 10 minutes or so uh, to put a hornet to sleep uh, when she's buried in crushed, uh, crushed ice. Um, but we find that there's, um, uh, you're less likely to make mistakes in terms of uh, sort of overdosing your hornet, uh, which can have then repercussions on her flight performance afterwards. Um, there are quicker ways of doing it. Uh, you could use a freezer, uh, which goes down to minus 20, uh, or you could use carbon dioxide. Um, but these then give you far less uh, margin for error, and it's a lot easier to overdose, which would then subsequently affect the flight performance of the Hornets. So there are risks involved with this. Uh, so hence, we tend to promote uh, using crushed ice. Um, and you just need a chill box. 
uh, which you filled with crushed ice, you bury the hornet in this, um, and uh, yeah, you bury it for, for 10 minutes, you check sort of her condition at the end of that, uh, and you basically want the hornet to have just uh, show very little movement, no more than just a, a faint twitch in uh, her tarsi or um, at, at most uh, to give you an indication of what we're looking for. Um, we use a restraining plate, which is described in our paper. Uh, it's just a piece of perspex that um, we used to uh, sort of um, prepare with a hacksaw, but we now find using um, laser cutting is a lot easier. Uh, the details are in the paper, so um, that's all available. Uh, basically, we use a piece of wire. We slide the um, anesthetized hornet under the wire, pull the wire tight, and then secure it. Um, which you'll hopefully see in this next video, um, which again, I'll just speed up in, in the interest of time. So it's just a case of moving the abdomen underneath the piece of wire. Uh, it go, the wire goes under the wings, so you're not trapping the wings. So, and then it's a case of just move, making sure the legs aren't trapped either. So you're ideally moving the legs forward, and that gives you then scope uh, to later to put the threads that you're um, basically you're tying the tag around the waist of the hornet. So we sort of end up a few checks here. So. Uh, all, all of this will obviously be available on the Atlantic Positive uh, website uh, in due course, and you'll be able to look at these videos in your own time. Um, so I'll, I'll skip the, the sort of type of equipment that we use, um, and I'll just show you now the, the process of attaching the tag to a restrained hornet. Um, again, I'll just speed it up a little bit. Uh, so we have text that comes up. I'm, I'm with this particular video, I'm also uh, talk, talking the method through. So you basically moving a thread around, tying a knot around the waist. And uh, then the tag is attached to the thread. And you then, uh, in essence, tying a knot in, uh, again to secure that. And then you're just putting a bit of super glue to secure that knot just to make sure that it doesn't unravel. and then cutting off the ends of your threads. Uh, there you have your hornet. And at this point, uh, we actually also feed a little bit of honey com coming out of um, sort of anesthesia or having to warm herself up after being chilled. Uh, she needs a little bit of energy to help her. So we tend to provide her to keep her in top performance. And then we also mark them uh, just just in case uh, a tag uh, is ever sort of removed from a hornet, we can still identify the hornet that was tagged subsequently. And uh, then uh, this, this is again, I guess the same process, which if I just whiz through, so you're passing the thread again around uh, the hornet. Uh, the tag is now uh, being attached. So tied on and the super glue uh, just to secure the knot, ends cut off, obviously avoiding the legs. Uh, and then at this point uh, here, I'm just, just putting that marker on. And as you can see, the Hornet has, by this stage has uh, fully recovered. Uh, so it's a relatively quick method uh, sort of to, to do this uh, in, in a safe manner. So um, a, co a colleague in Galicia, Aaron, uh, who is working with uh, Sandra, he has come up with his own uh, version of this, uh, which some people might find a little bit easier. Uh, in essence, the, the main difference is that he's actually, rather than uh, tying uh, the, uh, the, the transmitter uh, to the Hornet from underneath, he just puts the knot above. Um, just a slight variation. I have, uh, I've, you do have to be very careful with this. 
in that uh, when you are securing the knot with superglue, uh, you do actually need to delve down between the thorax and the abdomen, and you need to be a little bit more careful that you still allow the free movement of the tag at the end of this. Um, and as I mentioned, we like to uh, feed the hornet. So the, the, the whole point is for the hornet to be in the best condition to be able to get back to the nest, even carrying a, sort of a weighty tag. Um, so uh, it's like I mentioned before, the case of feeding them honey, which can be done while they are still attached to the restraining plate um, or otherwise uh, when they're just about to be released, this hornet was offered uh, a little pot of honey uh, that she's quite happy to uh, help herself uh, to before she departs uh, for her nest. Um, we, we actually um, also prefer to uh, put the hornets in a sort of a recovery tent or cage. And this is really more for us to be able uh, to check uh, that the hornet is in good condition, that we haven't snared uh, a leg somewhere, uh, that there's free movement of, um, oops, apologies for that, um, that there's free movement of the tag that it hangs freely. So in terms of uh, weight distribution as she's flying, uh, it's sort of basically a, a center of gravity sort of the around the middle and the tag sort of hangs down from that. Um, and also gives the hornet a little bit more chance uh, to get adjust to the weight uh, of this. So here's a hornet just flying, so we are confident that she can carry the weight. Um, so uh, the main points are that you are trying to keep your hornet in the best condition. So you're choosing the best hornet for this. You're making sure uh, there's no damage to her. She's well nourished and uh, the transmitter isn't impeding her movements at all. Um, and I'll just show this. So this is when it comes to release. Uh, she's recovered in the in our little recovery tent. Um, we collect the hornet. We're at the location where we want to release her already, which simplifies things. And off she goes into the tree, uh, which is actually quite common. They uh, tend to want to uh, stop somewhere uh, nearby. You also get this when you attach a feather or a thread to the hornets to make them more visible for visually tracking. It's that the first thing they want to do is get this item off them. And they will typically just go in a bush or a tree and they can spend as long as 30 minutes sort of trying to get things off, otherwise preening, resting, uh, etc., before they're eventually motivated to leave the nests. And here, just a quick uh, summary of the principles of uh, tracking with a transmitter uh, or rather with a receiver. So um, you are, uh, the, your tag is um, emitting a signal and your receiver is converting that into an audible sound. Uh, the strength of that audible sound or the, the volume of that audible sound gives you an indication as to whether the antenna is pointing in the direction of the hornet and that transmitter uh, or whether you're off to the side. So you swing your uh, antenna from side to side uh, to de determine where the strongest signal is. Uh, you initially would uh, maybe have the gain or the sensitivity set quite high uh, such that even if the hornet is far away, you, you can still detect her. But it does mean that you will pick up reflections that are sort of off to the side a little bit, which makes it a little bit harder to uh, know the precise direction. Um, but as you then move in that direction, you get closer to the hornet, you can reduce uh, the gain or the sensitivity, which allows you to then more precisely determine the direction. So when we are tracking, uh, we would follow the hornet as she's flying back. Uh, and as she becomes sort of stationary, uh, we may then actually end up spiraling in on our location, ever reducing the sensitivity of the receiver, allowing more precise uh, sort of direction until we sort of get close to where the Hornet is. Uh, so here's an example. Um, 
sorry, I just needed to just double check something. Nope, yeah, sorry. I'll uh, start that off again. So there she goes. Uh, you can just see her. Okay, I didn't check whether you can hear the sound on the video. Um, but anyway, in the interest of time, I will probably speed through this again. So it's a case of uh, moving to different vantage points and uh, basically using your antenna to determine the best signal direction. You might do this from various locations. Uh, the Hornet may not immediately move to the nest, obviously, so you might, you, you do need to bear in mind you are tracking the Hornet, uh, and it's only when she reaches the nest that you can then locate the nest. Um, but uh, uh, as you can see, we are working in a, um, uh, in a, a eucalyptus forest on the outskirts of Vigo. Uh, it's quite dense forest, uh, uh, sort of steep slopes in, in locations. So you are best uh, using what um, paths are available. Uh, you don't need to follow the Hornet. Uh, you don't need to follow the flight path of the Hornet. You're just basically working your way along to get close to where she is. So eventually we have success. So see if you can spot the nest. So this is typical uh, when you have a canopy uh, that actually the nests are extremely difficult to spot. Uh, so having an indication of which tree or which uh, cluster of trees the nest is in it's very helpful when looking for the nest through the binoculars. Uh, so this was done uh, with a reasonably large hornet uh, with one of the larger tags. Uh, and it took us an hour and a half from the point of release to find the nest. Uh, the, this particular hornet was actually uh, recaught the next day when it returned to the chicken bait, uh, which was rather convenient because it meant we could reuse the tag on, on a different occasion. And this is the flight. So initially, the, we, uh, the Hornet was released up here. Uh, it spent a lot of time up here, hence why we're circling around, until eventually it shot off. And then it was a case of chasing after it until we found it uh, uh, at its nest. And this, again, another example. Uh, but with this, ex uh, this one, we had uh, a Hornet a lot smaller. So this one was only 0.26 grams. So we used one of the smaller tags. Uh, and again, we successfully found the nest, even though it was again in thick forest, uh, so just over an hour and a half, 315 meters from the point of release, uh, with no prior knowledge where the uh, that nest was. So uh, just to show that it doesn't always happen in uh, perfect weather conditions, uh, the um, it was a sort of an overcast day, but dry when we started. We had a large hornet, which we fitted with a relatively small tag, um, and uh, we released this one. Um, but while we were tracking, it absolutely poured down. And people who are fami familiar with Galithia will know that it's right next to uh, the Atlantic and it basically gets the same sort of wet weather that we're used to down here in the southwest of England in Cornwall. Um, so as you can tell from my raincoat, it was a, a particularly wet day. Um, I'll just whiz through this. So again, just to give you an, a, a sense of the sort of types of things that we're looking for. Which was a, a very active nest, uh, this one. So, uh, but then there are other examples as, as well. This one, again, a, a smallish hornet, but here we were dealing with very steep slopes. And this is particularly to illustrate that you don't uh, take necessarily the, the path that the hornet takes, 
Uh, there were steep slopes all the way down here, so hence why we had to track all the way across. We'd lost the signal at this point because of the slopes involved. Uh, returned over here to determine that the Hornet was, had gone even further down uh, the slope. No way down here, so we had to follow a, a track to come all the way across to reacquire the signal here and hence find the nest right up in the middle of this conifer. Uh, so this was uh, at higher altitude, uh, so um, uh, it was less forested. Uh, there was an apiary, uh, one of Sandra's uh, apiaries here that actually were part of the experiment that Julio was speaking about earlier. Uh, and we caught a hornet um, at the apiary, uh, released her. Uh, the video that I showed you earlier of the release was actually this one. So this is where she initially went up into a tree here, then sort of uh, hopped from tree to tree, went into some brambles, eventually decided, okay, time to return to the nest. At uh, that point, shot off. And this is obviously our track rather than the track of the hornet, uh, where we then uh, were following the signal uh, sort of up a little bit here, uh, along uh, sort of parallel to the road, until eventually we found the nest right on uh, the road's edge, uh, again sort of um, high up in, in a eucalyptus tree. Uh, this particular hornet we, re we, uh, we are able to recover uh, because she returned to the apiary and got zapped by the electric harp. Uh, thankfully, the radio tag wasn't damaged in the process of being zapped by the, the harp. Um, but it's not just work that we've done in Galicia. We've, we've obviously worked in Jersey. And uh, this was a nest uh, that Alistair will remember. Uh, Bob Tompkins had uh, sort of identified the nest was likely in this area, but it was so dense that it was just almost impossible uh, to, well, partly get into, uh, but even then be able to find where the nest was. So we released the hornet up here initially went into a hedge along here for quite a while until eventually it shot off and then we used the tracks that were available to us to pop down here couldn't get anywhere through here there was a um, a stream and lots of fallen trees etc so we had to find an alternative way in having to go all the way around here reacquired the signal uh, sort of at this point and worked our way through to we until the point where we found the nest in high up in a tree uh, this was the very first um, hornet that we actually tracked uh, as part of the original work, but it just shows that tracking is also possible in sort of urban environments. Uh, so this is the INRA uh, research field station. Uh, there was an apiary here where we caught a hornet. Uh, there's a, a six foot perimeter wall uh, around the research uh, site, so uh, it wasn't possible to follow the hornet over the wall. So we went out through the gate to reacquire the signal the other side and uh, basically picked up signal from various points. we initially misled to go up here, but then followed the Hornet right down to the nest. This one very quickly, 45 minutes, even though the nest was uh, over 500 meters from the release site. So that was uh, uh, some examples. Um, and one of the really good things in terms of us sharing this technology with others, um, and we, we do have now people in various countries using the, this technique, in Germany, in Switzerland. In Switzerland, I think uh, they've nearly, um, up until recently at least, uh, all of the nests uh, that they found in Switzerland have been found by radio telemetry. Uh, there's also interest in Belgium, where they are beginning to use that technique in uh, the Netherlands. In Spain and France, uh, it's been used by researchers, but because of the numbers of nests around, the costs involved are probably too expensive. And it's been used in the Channel Islands, and also with um, the giant hornet, uh, or the northern giant hornet, as it's now called, uh, in Washington State, they've used the, the same technique over there. The more people are using the technique, obviously the more sort of experiences are shared and so the, the method is being even further refined. So some of the latest things that uh, I haven't had an opportunity to test yet, um, but uh, in terms of um, securing the hornets uh, while you're attaching the tag, there's thoughts about being able to do this without uh, sort of uh, anesthetic, without putting them to sleep first. Um, because anesthetics do have a, a sort of side effect, 
so it, it is best to avoid it. So we're now using uh, sort of hair grips uh, to hold the Hornet. Uh, and then uh, Chris Isaacs from Jersey has come up with a, a way of having a sort of a fishing knot that allows you to secure the, the tag uh, onto uh, the Hornet relatively quickly. So all various developments. And I'm sort of running over time. So just quickly to mention, uh, often drones are mentioned, uh, whether they could uh, benefit tracking. And clearly this is something that is being used elsewhere with, with other animals. So there's an Australian company, I think they've got branches in the US who are also using this. Um, but um, there are obviously extra costs involved. There may be restrictions in terms of where these would be allowed to fly, in particularly around urban areas. And ultimately, even if you have a drone that's uh, picking up signal uh, from a, a, a tree, you still need to have somebody on the ground to, to actually confirm it is a nest because um, the hornets will also go to uh, forage on nectar high up in the trees as well. So it's always worth uh, having to sort of check. But they obviously benefits in terms of uh, range and ability to cross terrain. But sometimes you can actually manage uh, some of that, at least in terms of range, even by just putting your antenna on a telescopic pole. This is something that we have used occasionally. Uh, so that can uh, be used in particularly problematic areas. So just to finish off with uh, a uh, acknowledgements to both colleagues at the University of Exeter, who obviously we've sort of had discussions about this work all the way along, but also all the partners uh, of the Atlantic Positive Project, with particular mention to the people at the University of Vigo, especially Sandra Rojas and her team, Aaron, Ilya, um, because uh, there's a lot of this work has been done in collaboration uh, with them uh, sort of a couple of years ago in Galicia. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, Pete. That was very informative, bringing us up to date with what uh, is happening with the tracking world. Got several questions for you. Yep. Um, something quite short. Besides using the harp, are there any ambient sounds or air disturbances that could be used around hives to chase Asian hornets away? Uh, it's it, yes, it's an interesting thought. Um, the, I'm not aware of any sounds that would necessarily uh, sort of scare the hornets away. Uh, they, they will, um, when um, a beekeeper is around with a racket uh, or a, a net, uh, etc., uh, th um, they do learn to avoid the beekeeper after some time. Uh, so do, they do respond to certain things uh, by altering their behavior. Um, uh, I, I believe Bob Hogg has done some work uh, where he was just trying to make loud noises next to a nest he was trying to observe to see to what extent the nests reacted, and they didn't react to it at all. Um, so I suspect the same would also happen in an, a, in an apiary. What they did this, uh, respond to at the nest were vibrations, so direct vibrations that came through the nest would get an immediate response from obviously the hornets defending it. Great, thank you. We've got several other questions, but maybe we'll give people a break. And uh, if you could come back to the Q&A at the end, 